let's spend a few more minutes uh, talking about this completeness relation uh so the identity is given by summation over i cat i bra i where the i's are the basis vectors hmm actually what you should do is uh, try and work this out so take an orthonormal um, basis so like and uh, verify that when you take cat run bra 1 plus cat to bra 2 plus cat 3 bra 3 which is basically your summation cat i bra i verify that you get over here the identity matrix in fact this is almost trivial take one more basis here you take this to be 1 over root 2 1 over root 2 0 take 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 0 and 0 0 one for this also verify that when you take summation over cat i bra i you recover the identity matrix so do that uh we can also check it directly from here without explicit calculation so this is an operator if i want to find out what is the uh n nth element of this all i need to do is take this and put bra m on one side and cat n on the other side so this becomes summation over i in a product of m with i in a product of i with n now if this is an orthonormal basis then you take the inner product of any two basis vectors you'll get the kronecker delta so this becomes summation i delta m i delta i n now when you're summing over these what you're doing is uh the kronecker delta forces this the first kronecker delta forces m to be equal to i the second kronecker delta forces i to be equal to n so basically this is just delta m n so what we have shown is that i m n is just delta m n makes sense no what is delta m n delta m n is uh, when m is equal to n it is 1 when m is not equal to n it is zero so that is just like a diagonal matrix with ones and zeros everywhere else so this is just a little bit of algebraic uh, manipulation to check that indeed we are getting the identity matrix when we do this okay now so again looking at the completeness relation so i is summation i cat i bra i what if i don't take the sum over here what if i only so this is cat 1 bra 1 plus cat 2 bra 2 plus cat 3 bra 3 and so on what if i don't do that what if i just take one specific one like if i am only interested in looking at cat 2 bra 2 what will that give me so let's see so i'll define an operator p i as just cat i bra i not sum so obviously the identity matrix is just summation over i of p i 
I want to know what are the properties of Ti. What does Pi do when I operate it on some vector v? So let's take some vector v. And I can write it in terms of its components. Uh, I'm going to use j because I've already used v over there. Uh, I already use i over there. So v j j. So what does the operator pi do? So the action of the operator pi on vector v is pi v which is just i i v but if you remember v inner product of i with v is just the ith component of v so this is just v i i so what we have done is we have extracted the part of the vector v along the basis vector i so we have resolved the vector so if this was my vector v and if this was my unit vector i what piv does is it projects this vector v onto the i axis this is basically vi i right so this pi is the projection vector projection operator along ith basis vector now there are some properties of a projection operator which is see suppose i take a vector i project it first along the x axis and then that i project along the y axis do you agree i should get zero because once i project it along the x axis it means i threw away all the y components of it and then the y component of a vector along the x axis will always obviously be zero so you can check that if i take projection along i and then projection along j this is going to be zero when i is not equal to j how should we check that so pi pj pi projection along the i axis is just i i pj projection along the j axis is just j j but what is inner product of i and j when i is not equal to j it is zero because they are orthogonal to each other so this is zero because i not equal to j and this is an orthogonal basis what if i i is equal to j so what happens with pi square let's see pi square is just pi pi so this is i i and then i i but i i is 1 again because it's it's an orthonormal basis so this is just i i so we just get back pi so pi square is just pi this also makes sense because once you have projected along the x axis let's say then if you again project along the x axis you will get back the same thing no change so pi square is pi so we can combine these two pi pj is 0 when i is not equal to j and pi pj is just pi when i is equal to j we can combine them and write together pi pj 
is just delta i j times p i. So when i is equal to j, you will delta i j will give you one, and you will just get p i. And when i is not equal to j, you'll end up with zero. So these are properties of projection operators. If you project first along one axis, then along some other axis, you get zero. If you project twice along the same axis, you again you retain that same the first projection itself. Nothing changes. And so here we can actually see the first physical example of these operators, and this comes about in the field of optics when we are talking about polarization. So let's set up some uh, axes. So let's say this is my x axis, this is my y axis, this is my z axis. I have light which is propagating along the z axis. And so light is basically electromagnetic wave. And that electromagnetic vector uh, is going to be oscillating in the xy plane. So in this xy plane, so this is the xy plane that I have drawn over here. In this plane, the electric field vector is going to be this. Let's say it makes an angle theta with the x-axis. Now, this is, uh, I'm talking about uh, plane polarized light. So, it has some x, the pol this vector E has some x component and it has some y component. So, E x is E cosine theta and E y is E sine theta. Now what I can do is, in the path of the light, I can put a polarizer. What a polarizer does is, it cuts off a, the component of light along a specific ac uh, axis. It only allows light which is along a different axis to go through. And this we use often, like your camera polaroids and all. That's why it cuts off glare, because it, it eliminates one component of, of the sunlight. So for example, if you put this through uh, and uh, like an X polarizer, X polarizer will, so I'm going to denote it as like this. So it will only allow the uh, component of the electric field along the X axis to go through. So then in the end, uh, what you will have is the light propagating like this and the electric field purely in the x direction. Or you can have a y polarizer which I will denote like this. And if you put, if you allow the light to go through the y polarizer then it's only the y component of the electric field that will survive, the x component will get cut off. So you can, so this acts like, like a projection operator in the x direction, this acts like a projection operator in the y direction. You can check, I mean physically you can see that if I first put an x polarizer and then after that I put a y polarizer, then nothing will go through. So that is saying Px, Py is equal to 0. Whereas if I put first an x polarizer and then one more x polarizer after this, then of course it's the same as just putting one x polarizer because the second one really does nothing. 
so this is an example of uh, a physical example of projection operators okay. now we come to the concept of the joint of an operator So let's say I have an I have with me an operator omega. Um, I want to define a joint of omega, which is denoted like this and this is called omega dagger that is how you say it <laughs> how is this omega dagger or a joint of omega uh, defined so suppose I have this inner product so omega acts on V and that you're taking inner product with W. What do I have to write on the left hand side for this? So if I were to, if I wanted to write this as just V on this side and something done to W, well, that something done to W is this omega joint. So this is the definition of omega. Omega adjoint is that operator which you can shift to the other side when you're taking an inner product uh, what does this mean in terms of actual matrices because the way i have said it over here doesn't really give us much feeling for what it means okay so let's find out what are the elements of this matrix omega dagger So if I want to find out the ijth element of omega dagger, I need to sandwich it between i and j. All right. But now if I Is it obvious from here? Yeah. Yeah. So if I want to move this omega dagger to the other side of the inner product, it just uh, becomes an omega. So this is just going to be omega i with j. But now what I can do is I can flip the order of my inner product and put a complex conjugate. So this becomes j omega i complex conjugate but what is this object this is just omega the j ith component of omega the whole thing complex conjugate right by definition so this is omega j i complex conjugate in other words If I take the ijth component of omega dagger, it is just the jth component of omega star. Or omega dagger is just the complex conjugate and transpose of omega complex conjugate of course because the star has come transpose because i j has become j i so the row has become column column has become row so if i give you any matrix operator and i say find it's a joint uh, by the way this is often referred to as the hermitian adjoint because sometimes the word adjoint is also used in some other contexts but anyway in quantum mechanics this is the only adjoint that we're dealing with 
so I will generally just say adjoint. So if I ask you to find the adjoint of any matrix operator, of any matrix operator, all you need to do is uh, transpose it and then take, comp take complex conjugate of its elements. That will do the job. So let's take an example. If I give you the two cross two matrix, two minus i one three plus two i then omega adjoint will be first time you transpose it so two minus i one three plus two i and then i need to take complex conjugate so minus i becomes plus i three plus two i will become three minus two i so this is the complex conjugate transpose of omega all right uh, pretty straightforward in that regard what if I give you a 3 cross 3 matrix 2, 0, 1, i minus i, 2, 2, 3 plus i, 3 minus i. Then omega dagger is going to be first you transpose it so 2i2 minus i0 3 minus i 2 3 plus i 1 and then you complex conjugate so wherever you find i turn it into minus i this becomes plus this becomes minus this becomes minus this becomes plus you will notice that in this particular case, omega and omega dagger are the same. This is a special kind of matrix. We'll talk about it in a little bit. So in general, I can talk about doing uh, this adjoint operation. So whatever, whenever we went from doing vectors, when we went from ket to bra, you can think of that also as basically being an adjoint operation. Because even over there, the ket was a column vector and I said if you want to find the bra of it you just transpose it and take the complex conjugate so this is not very mathematically rigorous way of doing it but you can think of the transformation from the ket to the bra as also being some sort of a joint operation which uh, basically does complex conjugate transpose so in general, suppose if I give you some uh, some kind of expression a1 omega1 v1 plus a2 omega2 v2 and I want to take the adjoint of this. And I, on purpose, I have taken an expression which has a scalar, a vector, and an operator. The other three things we're always going to be working with. Scalars, vectors, operators. So all three are there. If I want to take the adjoint of this, what will it become? V1 will go from being a ket to a bra. Omega1 will become omega adjoint. And I write it on this side with the understanding that it's operating to the left. And A1 becomes A1 star. Similarly, I get V2 becomes a ket, omega 2 adjoint over here with the understanding that it's operating on the left, and then A2 star. So this is how, so this entire thing is a vector, and so the ket vector, and this is how you make a bra vector out of it by doing complex conjugate transpose. Okay. A couple of uh, properties of the adjoint. First one, most obvious, if you take the adjoint of an operator, 
and then you take its adjoint again, you will come back to the original operator. Makes sense, no? Because a joint is complex conjugate transpose. If you con complex conjugate twice, you get back your original complex number. If you transpose twice, you come back to the same matrix. So if you do complex conjugate transpose repeatedly twice, you will recover your old matrix. Second property is that if I have a product of two operators and if I take its transpose, uh, if I take its adjoint, then this is B adjoint, A adjoint. How do I prove this? We'll go back to the definition of adjoint. So if I have this uh, A, B adjoint operating on W. By definition, this means I can take my AB to the left side. So this is bra of A, B, V with ket w. Now what I will do is I will treat this b v as one vector object. b v is an operator acting on a vector so it gives a vector. So I will take only the a to the other side and it will become uh, a joint. So I will get b v with a adjoint operating on w. Now I will take the b on the other side. So now the B will get adjointed so if I compare these two I get AB adjoint is B adjoint A adjoint I want to introduce two very important categories of matrices now and these will be of use everywhere in linear algebra. The first one is what we call a Hermitian operator. Or a self adjoint operator. So that example that I gave you before, where you take an operator A and you take its adjoint and if its adjoint is the same as itself, then we call it a Hermitian or a self-adjoint operator. Now strictly speaking, there is a subtle difference between a Hermitian operator and a self-adjoint operator from the strict mathematical sense. Uh, for our purposes right now, uh, let us not bother about it. Also, most uh, quantum mechanics textbooks don't really make a distinction between the two. So at least for the, for a first course in quantum mechanics, I, I don't think it's going to make much difference. So we'll, I will all, I will uh, use Hermitian or self-adjoint in an almost equivalent sense. Okay. What if my matrix A? So let's take an example. I want you to verify that this matrix is Hermitian. That if it if I take complex conjugate transpose of it, it will be the same as A. Note one thing, if I have a Hermitian matrix, I, the diagonal elements have to be real. Diagonal cannot be complex because see when I transpose it, the diagonal elements are going to remain in the same place and it has to be the same under complex conjugate transpose. So you cannot have a complex number on the, on the diagonal positions. Try putting a diagonal position and then see. Uh, and then do complex conjugate transpose, you will never get back the same matrix. So this is an example of a Hermitian operator. What if my elements were entirely real? If A is a real matrix, not complex, then of course, complex conjugation doesn't make any difference. So then 
for an operation to be for an operator to be hermitian that matrix will have to be symmetric if a is a real matrix then hermitian is the same as symmetric because then a has to be equal to a transpose complex conjugation is in it, it's irrelevant so then this becomes symmetric for example this is a hermitian matrix because it's real and symmetric okay the next category that i want to talk about is that of unitary operators and these also we will come across a lot a unitary operator is one whose inverse is simply its adjoint or in other words if i do u adjoint u or if i do u u adjoint i should get identity and these will be very relevant in in quantum mechanics